Hello, and welcome to the Origins Podcast. I'm your host, Lawrence Krauss. In this episode, we'll talk to the geophysicist Dan Schrag. I first learned about Dan as he gained national prominence for his groundbreaking work on paleoclimate, particularly the striking snowball earth hypothesis, now widely accepted that the earth froze over completely on several occasions between 600 and 800 million years ago. Since then, he's become a leading figure studying current climate change, as well as energy policy and technology. He directs Harvard's Center for the Environment and the Program on Science and Technology and Public Policy at Harvard's Kennedy School. Dan presents bold ideas of what we need to do to address the inevitability of climate change, as well as mediate it. Our in-depth discussion will inform anyone interested in the complex political and scientific challenges we need to deal with to move beyond our current crisis to a more sustainable world. Patreon subscribers can find the full video of all of our programs as soon as they're released at patreon.com slash origins podcast. I hope you enjoy the show. Well, Dan, it's good to be with you again, as always, uh, here in your lair, as it turns out. I, uh, there are a lot, so many things I want to talk to you about. Every time I'm with you, I learn something useful about the climate and the earth. Let me ask you, I want to start with your origins though. I I want to start, what, what was it about geophysics, geoscience that got you that made you do that rather than something else? You know, it actually took a long time, um, to answer that question for myself. Yeah, good. Well, you can take as long as you want to answer it here, too. <laughs> uh, I, I was an undergraduate at Yale, and uh, um, I'd always done science as a kid. In high school, yeah. I actually spent four summers working in a laboratory of a, of a neuroendocrinologist. My first paper is written about the um, angiotensin in the hypothalamus of the Brattleboro rat. <laughs> so... So doing biomedical mm-hmm. research, and I think everybody expected me to go to medical school. Uh, and I think that was just about the time where all my hormones said that I had to rebel, and so yeah. I did something different. Oh, okay. And I, I think I had this idea that I would become a physicist. Mm-hmm. And uh, I took a course my freshman year at Yale that was above the course that was normally offered for physics concentrators at Yale. Mm -hmm. This was a course for people with extreme physics and math preparation. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have it. And it was a very good life lesson that (laughs) there are just a handful of people who are always going to be much better and much smarter than you. Um, At the same time, I had taken a political science course on political theory and a a modern philosophy course from Harry Frankfurt Mm -hmm. and uh, was totally inspired. Um, But I couldn't quite give up science. And uh, the master of my college where I was living um, said to me, he was a physics professor, um, one of your old colleagues, Frank Furk. Oh, yes, I remember him. And he was a lovely man. I don't know if he was a good physicist, but he was a lovely man. Uh And he said to me, uh, you know, you should really try geophysics. (laughs) (laughs) But I kind of thought about it in terms of political science and resources. I ended up being a double major in political science and geology and okay. geophysics. It turned out to be perfect. In long. Um, yeah, it turned out I didn't put much effort into the geology and geophysics side. Mm-hmm. I put a lot of effort into the political theory side mm-hmm. um, and loved it. But when it was time to go to graduate school, I couldn't quite imagine becoming a philosopher. Mm. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know why. I, honestly, it was, I think, because I'd never imagined being an academic. But in the end, I went to Berkeley as, to study economic geology. And while I was there, luckily ended up meeting somebody, um, switching advisors and, and working on what I would call really basic fundamental questions. Mm-hmm. Not you know, these are these are about earth science, yeah. about how the earth works that have almost no relevance to people whatsoever. What I was studying was how alteration of the ocean crust, you know, a few kilometers mm-hmm. below uh, the ocean floor, mm-hmm. um, how that changes the chemistry of the rocks and how we can measure it by doing some diffusion reaction models. So mm-hmm. it was basically modeling fluid rock interaction in, mm-hmm. in basalts. Um, pretty obscure. Yeah. Um, what I discovered was that the changes in the chemistry of the sediments on top mm-hmm. was actually pretty significant. And those 
that chemistry was actually used to reconstruct ancient climate. Oh. So my entree into climate was actually a very backwards. It wasn't that I went to graduate school to study climate change or to study the environment. That was the furthest thing from my mind. But, you know, it's kind of, uh, I don't know whether poetic or useful or just uh, serendipitous that you're, I've always thought of you as someone, uh, maybe because of a kindred spirit, l- think, thinking of the physical mechanisms and like the actual physics behind not just climate, but all, but the way that the Earth system works. And so that physics background, or at least that scientific background, has been incredibly important in, in my mind in what you've done and, and in your ability, therefore, to not just communicate to the public, but, but to be able to do good science associated with climate change. So I think there's there's two aspects. Mm-hmm. Part of the reason climate change is so interesting yeah. scientifically yeah. is that it's actually an incredibly complicated and um, fascinating scientific experiment in the context of Earth history. Yeah, yeah. And so the science itself is really interesting, even if it had no societal implication. But but it does. But it actually does, and then that makes it a whole another and, aspect. And it's interesting because also uh, in your own life, the the this beautiful marriage between science and politics has carried out, as we'll talk about, and 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 I want to talk about science and public policy, which you've been involved in. But let's let's go. Uh, one of the big arguments that's given about climate change is, well, the climate always changes. You know, one of the big denial arguments is climate changes and and uh, and big deal. So the climate's changing now; it's always changed. And your work over over much of your work has involved the historical understanding of climate change, particularly over the history of the Earth, not just over the last 50 years. And you first became known to me with the, with the remarkable work on Snowball Earth. What, what, just to give a sense of perspective of where we're going to go when we talk about today's climate, why don't you talk about about the long-term climate changes and, 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 the, and the things that have happened in the Earth, including Snowball Earth? So what's actually interesting is... Uh, that the Earth has experienced such an incredible array of different climate states over its history. Um, and our knowledge of that history essentially um, gets worse and worse as we go backward in time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for the last 150 years or so, we actually have instruments. There are a handful of instrumental records that go further back, but it's, you know, it, it gets pretty bad b- before about 150 years ago. Before that, we have tree rings and some ice cores and some sediment cores, and they can give us pretty high-resolution records back over the last few thousand years. Mm -hmm. And then when we go back over the last few hundred thousand years, we actually have sediment cores from all over the world's oceans that give us, you know, century or multi-century resolution going back millions of years. And we can actually take that back, you know, over the last 65 million years. But as you start pushing it further back, a couple of things happen. The records themselves degrade sure. because rocks get buried, they alter, they chemically alter. That was actually the the, the topic of my dissertation. But in addition, um, essentially you're looking for a big signal. So when I moved, I taught at Princeton for three years after I left Berkeley and was working really on two timescales. I was working on sort of stuff that happened over the last 60 million years or so. And then also uh, looking at corals. Corals grow like tree rings. They put down about a centimeter a year of growth. And we can use them to get records of El Nino for the last few centuries or things like that. Mm. So I was reconstructing coral records with El Nino and then, you know, reconstructing El Nino with coral records and, and then working further back in time. But thought that basically prior to 50 or 60 million years ago, it was hopeless. And... Then I moved to Harvard and started this friendship with a guy named Paul Hoffman. Mm -hmm. And Paul was a geologist who spent uh, most of his career studying the Precambrian. Mm -hmm. But he was an unusual Precambrian geologist. Many And and just for some listeners, the Precambrian is some six, seven hundred million years ago. Yeah, it's before about 540 million years ago. Okay. And it is an interesting time period because it's essentially most of Earth history. Yeah. The Earth's four and a half billion years old. Sure. So the first four billion years essentially is the Precambrian. Yeah. And it is the time. So the, the, the thing that marks the Cambrian is the appearance of, uh, of lots of trace fossils. It turns out as we look at the record, there are some fossils before the, 
the Cambrian, many of them. Yeah. But at the time, this was an, an explosion where you saw um, uh, all sorts of bioturbation and all sorts of uh, an explosion in the fossil record. In fact, if I'm right, of course, people in many people because that's when fossils first were seen. For many people, that early on, that was the origination of life. They didn't realize that life had gone much earlier than that. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And in fact. Um, uh, some of the classic work by Harold Urey, the great chemist yeah. at the University of Chicago, um, uh, early on when he was when he was doing early work on carbon isotopes and and oxygen stable isotopes, yeah. he actually wrote in a paper that you know the carbon isotopic composition of organic carbon could test whether there was life back through geologic time because of the fractionation from photosynthesis. Yeah. So, so I mean, amazing history there. Yeah, yeah. And I think at the time the paleoclimate community ignored, frankly, most of the Phanerozoic, which is the last 540 million years. They, they really thought back to the Cretaceous, but not much before that, which is sort of the last 60 to 100 million years. Okay. When I first got up and gave a talk on the work that Paul Hoffman and I did on the snowball earth, mm -hmm. these were two glaciations that occurred in the Neoproterozoic, which was a period from about 750 million years ago to about 600 million years ago. That's when the, the glaciations occurred. Um, and, and, and just to make it clear by glacier, we're not talking about small scale glaciation, we're talking about a snowball. <laughs> that's right. Um, and and, and the, you know, pe people said, how could you possibly work on this? You know, we don't know anything about the Precambrian. This is, you know, the, the rocks are so altered, how do you say anything? And the answer is, it's a signal to noise issue. Mm -hmm. when, the, when the environmental signal is so huge, it turns out you can see it above mm -hmm. All, All of the complications. And, I, you know, it'll come back, because I want to talk about the Earth and other planets, but uh, the, f the fact that the Earth, which is habitable, uh, certainly, apparently, uh, at this point, uh, was essentially all, uh, frozen over in its history. I mean, it was just shock. It, I know it shocked me. I think it was very controversial. But that's going to be relevant to understanding the history and origin and nature of life uh, in other planets in the solar system. Well, I think, you know, as you know, science is about storytelling. Yeah, yeah. We scientists sometimes don't like to admit that. Yeah. But it's true. Yeah. Good There's science is a good story. I've said the greatest story. But yeah, anyway. That's right. And I think there is, in all good stories, there are only a handful of themes. Mm -hmm. And one of the classical themes is catastrophe and redemption. <laughs> yes. Right? I yeah. mean, that's, that happens again and again. Yeah. Exactly. And I think... You know the 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 mass extinctions, whether mm -hmm. it's the Promo Triassic extinction yeah. or the Cretaceous Tertiary extinction. So the meteorite hits, all sorts of things die. Yeah. The dinosaurs get wiped out, but the mammals arise, and yeah. look here we are. Right? right? What a great story of catastrophe and redemption. Yes. Similarly, um, it turns out that that may actually be the story of the snowball Earth. Yes. That we are doing work right now that links those snowball glaciations, both that time and then uh, about 2 billion years earlier, um, about 2.4 billion years ago, there was another pair of snowball glaciations. Oh. And both of these coincidentally occur right at the time when oxygen jumps up in the atmosphere. The overall pattern in Earth history was for the first 2 billion years or so, there was essentially no oxygen in the atmosphere. Which, by the way, I mean, most people don't realize. And well, of course, for a long time, that Yuri and others, I mean, people assumed the primeval atmosphere was similar to what, what it is now or, or in many ways. And of course, what people don't realize is that it's darn lucky for life on Earth that there wasn't any oxygen early on because oxygen would have uh, essentially, I mean, life is slow burning and oxygen would have basically taken all the organic materials and and oxidize them, and which is what life sort of does. Well, there's an interesting mm. thing about you know how much oxygen is too much oxygen. Yeah, yeah. But but yeah. So so we think that you know there was about I mean ten to the minus six, ten to the minus seven of present atmospheric levels yeah. of oxygen in the early days. In the early days. So this happened for the first couple billion years. Mm -hmm. So origin of life happens in that environment. Um, a lot of people studying the origin of life don't. They, they sometimes forget that it's truly an anoxic environment and yeah. it's very different, possibly hydrogen rich. Yeah. Then around 2.4 billion years ago, there's very clear evidence of a jump in atmospheric oxygen. It's called the great oxidation event. Mm. Yes. And the timing of it is almost exactly coincident. We think 
perhaps exactly coincident mm -hmm. with this global glaciation, one of the snowballs. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, around 600 million years ago, we think oxygen went from something like 1% of current level. So, so after the great oxidation event, oxygen is higher, mm -hmm. but it's not like modern. It's yeah. maybe 1% of modern. Okay. So essentially everything was still unicellular. Yeah. But you started to have algae. Instead of just prokaryotes, you had prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So what that means is cells with a with a with mitochondria, later on with uh, chloroplasts. Mm -hmm. So it's it's more like our cells. Yeah. Prepared to but they're still it. single cells. Yeah. Um, what happens, it's possible that multicellular animals evolved sometime in this period in the Proterozoic, but if they did, they were really tiny. They were like multicellular little amoeba things. Yeah. They were tiny little guys. Yeah. And the reason is because oxygen's only 1%. If, you, if oxygen's very low, you can't get big well, it, because you fact, have a, a diffusion problem. Well, uh, yeah. And I mean, to make it even clearer, I, I think of it in terms of physics as I, it's not surprising, but um, oxygen allows living systems ultimately to get about 40 times more uh, more energy um, than they would in in the case of sort of photosynthesis or in, in, a, in, in a... Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, key, it, the key reaction there is actually um, if you try to, to eat food, yeah. if you're a heterotroph, yeah. And you try to eat food, mm -hmm. so you take organic carbon, and you try to oxidize it with something like iron mm -hmm. or with sulfate or yeah. something like that. It turns out you get about, you know, twenty percent of the energy that you would get if you used oxygen. Yeah, the point is that I mean, much lower energy yield. Yeah, much lower energy yield. I mean, that's what life is but, for but there's people. Plenty it's of anaerobic, but mm -hmm. there's plenty of anaerobic heterotrophs that do just fine. Yeah. The point is that that. Um, if you tried to make a multicellular animal in low oxygen, mm -hmm. so so then oxygen jumps up one percent. Mm. That's plenty for using oxygen now. Yeah, yeah, right. So so a lot of the the um, zooplankton and you know single celled organisms would do just fine in yeah. that one percent of oxygen. But when you try to get big, imagine you're the cell in the middle of a cluster of yeah. cells. Mm -hmm. You don't get any oxygen, mm -hmm. right? And and the way we solve that in our big bodies today is we have a circulatory system. Yeah, but it's hard to evolve a circulatory system before you get big. Yeah, there's yeah. a chicken egg problem yeah. there. Mm -hmm. So so what we think happened was around 600 million years ago, oxygen went from one percent to something within a factor of a few of modern level. So it went up by a factor of you know 20, 30, 40, yeah. something like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And that allowed everything to get big. And that's when multicellular animals happened. So in some ways, the interesting part of our work on oxygen and the snowball is that it was the glaciation, this environmental catastrophe, yeah. that actually changed the environment. We have a mechanism where it, the, uh, the, the glaciation actually allows for a jump in oxygen levels. You, is it simple to describe? Well, it's not that simple, but essentially... Um, what we found is that when you think about um, when you think about atmospheric oxygen, you have to worry about electrons. It turns mm -hmm. out yeah. that, that you either you're talking about oxidation and redu yes. reduction, and there are really only a few geochemical cycles that matter. Mm -hmm. You have to worry about iron, and you have to worry about sulfur, and you have to worry about uh, carbon. Yeah. And when you couple those, what we found was that this very simple model we put together actually showed three stable equilibrium states. A very low one, mm -hmm. like what the Archean was, mm -hmm. essentially no oxygen. A medium one that was about 1% of current levels, and then a kind of modern level. This is stable when when it's glaciated, when, when it's- No, no, no. 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 Okay, the, before. The, the point is that that each of, if you were in one of these states, you'd the change. geochemistry, you, you, there, you, there, you, there are actually some very strong negative feedbacks that keep you I in see, that state. So you won't change, but you need something dramatic to make it change. But it turns out you need a kick to get you from one state yeah. to the other. Mm -hmm. And we think the snowball was that kick. So so if you actually, so, so if, if I were to give you my version of the history or the evolution of the earth and the evolution of life, mm -hmm. it's first of all, um, not inevitable that we would end up here. Yeah. It's very important because- um, some people think that there's sort of this, you know, direction. Yeah. And the answer is, you know what? Were it not for those snowball glaciations, we could still be in the Archean with prokaryotic cells with uh, 
essentially no oxygen. Yeah, it wasn't written. I, think, I mean, that's one of the lessons of all, I mean, from my experience of the whole universe, is a series of remarkable accidents. There's no way that we were destined to be here. It's a very fortuitous It situation. makes the appearance of multicellular animals and ultimately yeah, yeah. humans even more extraordinary. Yeah. Because you realize that these glaciations didn't just happen to Earth history. Right. They aren't just a, you know, an interesting mass extinction. Yeah. They actually completely shaped the evolution by actually changing the atmospheric conditions with respect to atmospheric oxygen, which changed everything, allowed life to get there. And big. I think that's what, I mean, in in giving historical perspective, because we're getting to the present uh, ultimately, the, the point is that we humans who live for such a short time in a cosmic sense or even a geological sense think of things as having always been this way it, and 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 it's natural to assume they've always been that way but that the the earth is very dynamic the climate is very dynamic and and the development of life and living systems depends crucially on on subtle sometimes subtle changes and that's going to obviously be relevant when we think of our own future and of course what's the reason that that's not so intuitive is that these generally have taken place over geological time and we're in a situation now where there are changes that are happening on a much faster scale that are unprecedented in the history of the Earth. And, and, but it's interesting to see that, that how dramatic the changes have been in, in the nature of life and the, and the atmosphere and the chemistry of, of what's going on on, on Earth. And, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, um, at the same time, you know, uh, I think you know, l let's get into what's happening today yeah, and okay. talk about, about the historical context for it. Yeah. You're right, it is unprecedented, and it's particularly unprecedented in the pace, mm -hmm. right? It's the, it's the rate of change that's unusual. Yeah. On the other hand, a geologic perspective on this is healthy because the Earth is going to be fine. Yeah, the, <laughs> the Earth will be fine, exactly. Um, uh, and in fact, life, you know, I've, I, I, I remember writing, when I was first learning, actually from one of your colleagues, Andy Knoll, I was learning enough about to write in one of my books about the history of, ox well, oxygen on Earth, and I was just learning. And, uh, and it struck me, I think it's a characteristic generally that, of course, from a natural selection or evolutionary perspective, catastrophes open up a whole new window. So life life in some ways in the long run life loves catastrophes so and, catastrophe and redemption is this yeah, theme yeah, right yeah, and yeah. and you keep coming back to it and it's fascinating um yeah. i had a conference a few years ago gathering a bunch of conservation biologists uh -huh. people who study the science of conservation mm -hmm. it's a little bit of a funny field but yeah. it's it's a very important thing today especially mm -hmm. how do you actually conserve mm -hmm. species for example and a lot of conservation biologists focus on species mm -hmm. And the reason I was gathering them was because I was trying to be a little provocative. Uh -huh. What I wanted to do was challenge them a little to think about the timescale of climate change. One of the things that, that you understand or that we understand from studying the geologic past is that the timescale of climate change, you know, most of the IPCC studies mm -hmm. and the UN stuff, um, people look at 2100 or 2050. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They might go out to 2150. Yeah, yeah. Right? But remember that, you know, of the atmospheric CO2, so when we burn fossil fuels, about 60% of the CO2 stays in the air, about 40% goes into the ocean and the land. That 60% that goes into the air, half of that is still going to be there a thousand years from now. That's of vital importance. I think that if it's one thing people should understand. It's, it's really important. People don't think about it this way, but you know, nuclear waste, mm -hmm. high-level nuclear waste in a thousand years, mm -hmm. about 1% of the radioactivity is left yeah. because most of it has short half-lives. Yeah, yeah. Right? So that's what makes it so nasty. Yeah, exactly. That's why the stuff you worry about is the stuff that has short half-lives. Right. So a thousand years from now, nuclear waste, 1%. Yeah. CO2, 50% in a thousand years. And 20, and, and probably about a third of it will still be here 20,000 years from now. So the timescales are really long. We are changing the earth not just for a few generations, but for tens of thousands of generations of humans, if humans are so lucky to, to, to stay on this yeah. earth for that long. So that's you know hard to get your head around. Absolutely, and it, 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 it'll, it'll become relevant. What many people say um, you know, is, well, why, you know, maybe this is a problem, but we have economic problems, we have other problems. Well, let's not worry about it now, let's worry about it in 50 years. And the problem is we, if you keep dumping it in there, Dealing with in 50 years becomes so much harder than now. 
So, so let's come back to that. Yeah, okay. Because this this conference was really interesting, gathering these eco- these conservation biologists. Okay. And what I wanted to do was ask them, okay, so climate change, you're not just trying to save species from extinction. Mm-hmm. You know, so the, uh, conservation groups, you know, World Wildlife Fund, yeah, um, uh, many of uh, the other NGOs mm-hmm. that do species conservation, conservation yeah. and biodiversity protection. Uh-huh. You understand this is a multi-billion dollar a year effort. Yeah. This is not small. Yeah, yeah. And I, I sort of felt like, you know, they're trying to save species from extinction. And, you know, if you think about this, you know, are you really trying to save species from extinction today so they go extinct a few hundred years from now? Yeah. Or are you actually really trying to preserve biodiversity? Mm-hmm. And if you actually take conservation seriously, in my view, in the context of the timescale of climate change, you should um, uh, maybe think things differently. You know, maybe instead of worrying about this species of frog and this species of frog and this species of frog, you might say, you know what? I want to make sure we have frogs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, the, you, I'm not saying you that the efforts that, th- these are great organizations. Yeah. They do a lot of good work. And I'm not trying to, to belittle what they do at all. I'm just saying, I think we actually need to step back and think about what we're doing um, and question, are there additional things we might be doing in this broader context of the timescale of this problem. And given, and this is one of the things I really have learned in my time with you that you, is, is relevant, is that we can't stop what's already started and we have to start thinking about how we deal with it. And, right. and, and, you know, it's not a matter of giving up. It's not a matter of saying, let's throw up our hands and just, you know, keep driving, you know, big cars and not worrying about that. But we have to recognize that these things are happening and have happened and 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 we've put in you know, what it is, or 50 gigatons of carbon in the, into the atmosphere. 500, over, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and over per year, maybe. And and that that's there, and it's going to have an effect. And there are th- things we're going to have to deal with, like it or not. That's right. So, so the interesting response of these biologists yeah. was fascinating. Yeah. Many of them said, I, I don't care about these timescales because... All the things we study are going to be gone in the next fifty years. It was a very. I mean, I thought. I thought. I thought I can be dark sometimes. Yeah. These conservation biologists really had a dark view of the world. But what was the fascinating was my friend Doug Irwin. Doug is a paleontologist Doug. Yeah. at the Smithsonian, mm-hmm. and is a brilliant scientist. Yeah. And Doug said, "You know, what are we trying to save here? Are we trying to save species. Are we trying to save. But he said, from a geological perspective, you know, what I had said was." I would love to try to avoid this becoming like the Cretaceous tertiary yeah. extinction or the yeah. Permo-Triassic extinction. Yeah. Um, you know, people talk about the sixth extinction. I was just going to say people talk about the sixth extinction. I don't think it's true yet. I think it's I think it's slight hyperbole. But there are there's no doubt that there's that that species are disappearing at a, a much faster rate. They since, absolutely are. Since humans and have been since throughout their history. We've been a, done a very good job, effectively. At causing extinctions, but remember that, like at the Permo Triassic, we lost like ninety percent. Oh no, no, I know, but it's just so, so we're not there are, yet. Yeah, yeah. But but Doug said, you know what? Look what happened after the Permo Triassic. Yeah. Like everything say, recovered. I was just well, I've often wondered that if if especially if we got rid of humans, that there'd be an explosion of new. Ideas. So, so what's interesting is, and I realized, you know, applying sort of human values and human morality yeah. to geologic time and evolution mm-hmm. is a very tricky thing. Sure, because. Things, you know, catastrophe and redemption, you know, we are programmed to think catastrophe is catastrophic. It's terrible. Yeah, yeah. Especially if it's us. <laughs> right. Yeah. And and it's it's more complicated than that. Yeah, yeah. No, it's I, there's no doubt that we're changing the earth and there's a lot of species that are going to be extinct. But it's probably unfair to suggest that that won't up. It, it will be true that that will open up evolutionary niches for new species that wouldn't have been able to to survive before. Now that's often a very bad thing because there that we often find in the United States and other places that that predatory species that are that are dangerous are coming are now viable that weren't before and then we're going to have to learn to live with that. But there's no doubt we're opening up even as we even as we change the environment we're opening up evolutionary new evolutionary niches somewhere. That's right. So 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 let's get back to the, yeah. the question of the sort of Historical context for what the what yeah, we're doing today. Yeah, it's good. Let's because do because I think it's important to understand. You know, we actually know the historical climate for the last 
several million years yeah, really well. Exactly, and I think that's an important thing too because and, people say, well, the question is always, well, people weren't around, how do you know it? And the point is there's lots of evidence. And But I wanted to, I think it's really important in the if we're really gonna have a serious and intelligent discussion about climate change today to have that historical context. So I'm glad we, we've discussed it. Anyway. So, 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 you know, we, for the last couple million years, we had these periodic ice ages. Yeah. Um, and we know a lot about it. Mm -hmm. um, they were driven by subtle changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun, um, changes in how tilted the Earth was or, or its precession around the sun, and, 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 um, and the interaction with essentially two main factors. Ice sheets, mm -hmm. which can amplify climate signals because mm -hmm. when ice grows, it reflects more sunlight back to space and has a powerful positive feedback. That's part of the snowball Earth phenomenon yeah, too. Yeah, sure. Um, and also carbon dioxide. So the carbon cycle is another positive feedback. Um, and these things seem to have worked together to keep us in this relatively stable pattern of you know fluctuation between glacial maxima and glacial minima, or what we call yeah. interglacials. Let, let me interrupt for a second, just as when you talk about the, the reflecting sunlight into space and carbon cycle, it, what's really important, it seems to me, in, in talking about this to members of the public and, and sometimes politicians, is that this isn't always rocket science. The details are very complicated models, but the basic physics of energy flow is 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 pretty is pretty straightforward. That's exactly and, right. And what's surprising is that it works. I mean, maybe not surprising, but when when you see that these basic this basic physics predictions work, there's good reason to trust them. So yeah, I mean, the basic idea of climate change has been around for a hundred years. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not... just the energy in, energy out. It's it's not it's not much different. I mean, the stuff, that's not to minimize the incredible complexity of clouds and 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 the way and where on earth temperature will change and and how it impacts on on sea level and all that but but the basic physics of energy in energy out of which carbon dioxide is a part is not rocket science no absolutely not and indeed you know people sometimes forget our neighboring planet venus yeah. right which is very similar to the earth in yeah. size and is about 460 degrees celsius on its surface yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. And and uh, super hot. Why? It turns out most people think because it's closer to the sun. Yeah. And it's true. Venus gets about twice as much solar energy as the Earth does because yeah. it is closer yeah. to the yeah. sun. But because it's so bright and reflective on the surface, uh -huh. if Venus had the same atmosphere as the Earth, uh -huh. it would be substantially colder than the Earth, Int which is interesting. It is interesting. The reason it. Venus is so hot, you know, it's, mm. you know, 460 it, Celsius. It, it's it's pretty hot. Incredible yeah. hot. It's because it has an atmosphere almost 100 times thicker than the Earth, and 97% of that atmosphere is carbon dioxide. Yeah. Okay. So, so you know, the, the greenhouse effect as a as a as a phenomenon is really not in question. And and it was relevant at the early history of the Earth. The Earth would have been. I mean, the sun has been getting it, it, brighter. It was 15% less bright in the early history of the Earth. Star and, and and so we should have been frozen, except the carbon. And then there was a greenhouse. A effect that preserved liquid water on the earth in the early history of the earth. The carbon dioxide density was something like 10,000 times what it is now in the very earliest moments of the earth or something. Pro probably not that thick, but, and there may have been some additional gases yeah. as well. But here's the, but but the general idea is there's actually a remarkable chemical reaction. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so there's a chemical reaction between carbon dioxide, water, which makes carbonic acid, yes. and then rock. Yes. And that reaction, igneous rock, volcanic yeah. rock, and that reaction yields, essentially it's an acid-base reaction. Mm -hmm. So carbonic acid is an acid mm -hmm. and it reacts with the igneous rock and basically makes calcium carbonate or Store, chalk or limestone. Stores the carbon. And so essentially that chemical reaction takes carbon dioxide out of the air and converts it to limestone on the ocean floor. Yes. What's amazing about that, so that reaction, because that reaction is temperature dependent, mm -hmm. that becomes a thermostat. Yeah. So when the earth gets too hot, that reaction speeds up uh -huh. and CO2 is drawn down. And when that reaction goes too slowly, volcanoes naturally Produce. trick. Now remember, volcanoes are only putting out about 1% of what we're burning from fossil fuels. So it's not like volcanoes are a danger, yeah. but they're doing it all the time. Mm -hmm. And the CO2 coming out of volcanoes is balanced by what is going back down as calcium carbonate. It's this remarkable And so it's this incredible cycle. Until life evolved. But now, yeah. now, what we're... What we're doing to it is really extraordinary. Yeah, um, we are perturbing it by a factor of a hundred. Yeah, that's important. I think that you know when people now, say the Earth will take care of it, right? Again, yeah. this, these chemical weathering reactions, this reaction between water and rock and and CO two, 
will happen and but, it will take care of our problem. Yeah, but, but on geological... But it will take about 100 to 200,000 years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's just not fast enough. If, if, yeah. <laughs> no, so I, I was going to say, people, when they hear about this natural thermal stuff, they say, well, the natural reaction be, why worry? Look, the Earth's taking care of it, but it won't. But we're changing things on a scale that, that the Earth can't adjust to. I think there's another aspect of global warming that, again, is relatively simple physics that people um, can understand. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at a... a pattern of global warming. What you see is that um, the Arctic's warmed a lot more than the rest of the world over yeah. the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. And also that the land has warmed about twice as much as the ocean. Mm -hmm. So, you know, overall, the world's warmed by about one degree. Uh, over land, that number's almost two degrees. And it turns out there's a very simple reason for that. You know, when we, when we plant tulip bulbs uh -huh. in the fall, you plant them a few inches down mm -hmm. and they're protected from the frost of the winter, uh -huh. right? Since Lord Kelvin in the 19th century, he actually measured uh, temperature down a mine shaft to study the diffusion uh -huh. uh, through soils. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, he did all of these amazing experiments. Um, he was interested in the age of the earth from thermal conductivity. Yeah, it's wonderful. I mean, that's what I always love about when I do physics is that whatever question you have, someone has spent their life studying it. It's yeah, really kind it's of amazing. it's remarkable. But- it, when you think about um, this problem, uh, it means that the surface of the earth doesn't actually have a whole lot of ability to absorb heat. Mm -hmm. And the reason is not because it has low heat capacity. Rock actually has a lot of heat yeah. capacity. It's, it's that essentially rock is, you have to diffuse. You're, yeah. you're, 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 you're conducting that heat through a solid and that's yeah. fundamentally slow. Yeah. That's why you can plant your tulip bulbs a few inches down and they're protected from the winter th yeah, freeze, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, so, but the ocean is different. The ocean mixes. Mm -hmm. The upper 100 meters mixes almost instantly because of the winds and the churning. Yeah, sure. um, deeper down, you have currents that, that mix it on slightly longer timescales, but, you know, decades to centuries, now you're talking about, you know, the upper 1,000 meters of the ocean and the deepest ocean, the four or 5,000 meters down is mixed over 1,000-year timescales. But what that means is if you had the planet completely land and you and if you if we had a com no oceans at all and we raise the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere like we've done by burning fossil fuels mm. the earth's surface would heat up relatively quickly and achieve that equilibrium really quickly uh -huh. because it, there's not much ability it's, to soak up heat yeah we have a world that's covered with ocean mm -hmm. right 70 percent of our of our surface is covered with ocean and it mixes and so what you can think of this is, do the experiment. You know, you're adding carbon dioxide. The Earth's trying to heat up, mm -hmm. right? Energy's coming in. And the way you achieve that energy balance is by the surface heating up so that the radiation going out equals the radiation coming in. Exactly. But the problem is the oceans are cold. Yeah. And it takes a while to heat up because they mix that heat downward. And so essentially 90% of the energy from the greenhouse effect yes. that that's being absorbed by the surface of the earth is going into heating the oceans. Where do we see that? We actually see that in sea level rise. So exactly. thermal expansion of water. And so in some ways, sea level rise is global warming. Yeah. And because that's 90% of the energy. You know, global warming is ocean warming. Yeah, I, I want to slow, I want to decompress that a little bit for people because I think a lot of people think sea level rise comes just from simply melting of ice you know, in, in Antarctica or Greenland. But the point is that the sea level rise we're seeing, when water heats up, it expands. That's it's right. just simple. And, and so today it's about half, maybe a little less, 40% of the total sea level rise is due to thermal expansion. Mm -hmm. There is an important contribution from Greenland sure. and from Antarctica. Sure. It turns out that over the next century, those are going to get much bigger. Yeah, exactly. Thermal expansion will continue, <laughs> but, but the melting of the ice sheets is what we have to worry about because they're the ones that can that can really add to the sea level rise. But today, global warming, like it's 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 happening. And people too often use like surface temperatures yeah. to indicate global warming. You yeah. say, that's the tail. Yeah. That's not the dog. The dog is the ocean. Yeah. Right? And if you want to see global warming, measure the temperature of the ocean. What's incredible is that we actually have new technology now. You know, until 15 years ago, the way we measured the temperature of the ocean is we went out on ships. Yeah, sure, I remember that. For, for, dropped oceanographers. thermometers down yeah. on a wire yeah. and measured them. That's what physical oceanographers did. Yeah, yeah. 
Hank Stommel, the great physical oceanographer who, who was at Woods Hole and at MIT, um, uh, Hank Stommel, in the I guess in the fifties, he said, uh, oceanography is like trying to do weather forecasting with a handful of of cars towing kites around <laughs> on a moonless night <laughs> with clouds so that you couldn't see into the medium. Oh, wow! You know okay. that's essentially yeah. what oceanography was. Yeah. 15 years ago, they started this program called Argo, where these floats, they actually are designed to sit at about 1,000 meters depth. Uh -huh. And every 10 days, they drop down to 2,000 meters, and then they slowly rise up to the surface, taking measurements every meter mm -hmm. of temperature and salinity. And then when they get to the surface, they beam the data back to a satellite, and then they sink back down to 1,000 meters and wait another 10 days. Yeah. We now, in you know, in a few years... We collected more data on the oceans than we had in the whole history of oceanography. How many of these things are out there? There are about 4,000 of them. And it's a huge international program. Mm -hmm. The U.S. is the biggest contributor, but we're probably, we, we've certainly contributed much less than half. There are, I think, 60 nations that have contributed to these fl this float nice program. It's nice to see a global effort for a global problem. It it's is, always nice to see that. It has transformed our yeah. understanding of the oceans. And it, we've allowed, it's allowed us to see that the oceans are indeed heating up. Mm -hmm. And that is to me the real proof of global warming. Yeah. There's another dark side of this though, which is that um, it means that if we were to somehow magically freeze the level of CO2 tomorrow, yes. not emit any more carbon dioxide from burning fossil yeah. fuels, yeah. which is not possible. Yes. Um, uh, the ocean's probably got another thousand years of warming yeah. <laughs> because the oceans are not in equilibrium, right? The oceans are cold. Yeah. They're soaking up this heat. And they're going to still coke it up. And, and the carbon dioxide's still there. And yeah. it's we, so, so if you think about it, the land gets to equilibrium pretty quickly. The oceans are lagging behind. And so we may have close to double the amount of warming we've already experienced already committed in the system. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, an, that's a very important thing. But I, there's two... Two points I want to take from this. One is that, yeah, even if we stop things today, there are going to be effects we can change. And two, many people think climate change is, is all based on predictions and models in the future, but it's happening now. It's based on data you can measure. And even if, you know, a senator brings a snowball into, into the Senate, the point is that, this, you know, the, you make measurements of the ocean that are unambiguous. It doesn't matter whether it's cold today in Boston and oh my God, there's no global warming because it's, we're having a cold winter. They're, they're, they're real measurements that show you exactly what's happening unambiguously. It's not model dependent. It's not consensus dependent. It's not politically dependent. It's happening. That's right. And the models we use, honestly, there are problems with them. Yeah. yeah. But it turns out it's really difficult. You know, the yeah, Earth's sure. a complicated system. Sure. And to predict accurately what's going to happen 100 years from now is really, really hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when I teach about climate change, I actually don't even mention climate models till the end of the course. Mm -hmm. It's not, I mean, there are very important tools to try to test ideas and think about what the future might be like. Mm -hmm. But I would never use them to actually make a prediction of the future. Um, or at least make sure that I understand that there's some big error bars. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot we don't understand about the system. Yeah, okay, but okay, so let's put now, let's let's go in perspective and 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 talk about the changes that, that, that have taken place due to human industrial activity, what's already happened, the, the range of possibilities of might, what might happen, and then and then I want to talk about about dealing with this so through politics and that's technology. That's for me one of the most interesting things about this problem. And, yeah. and I got to say, for me, this was partly very personal. Um, 20 years ago, I was giving talks all the time about climate change from a geological perspective. Yeah. So I would talk about paleoclimate and I would talk about the ice ages and I would talk about the Eocene, which was one of the last times when the earth was very warm. Mm -hmm. And that would put sort of climate change in perspective. Yeah, yeah. And then I would end my talk. <laughs> and I would sort of leave people hanging. And for me, I, I, I think the audience liked it, but yeah. it was very unsettling <laughs> for me. I was like... Yeah. This just feels cruel. Yeah. And so I started teaching a course, um, and I'm lucky enough to be here where I have lots of colleagues who know a lot about this. Mm -hmm. I, taught, I, I, I taught a seminar with John Holdren for undergraduates for many years, and John studied energy systems for years. John Holden, by the way, was the president's science advisor in the, for, uh, in the Obama, for Obama administration. Obama. Yeah. yeah. 
And, and uh, he started the Energy and Resources Group at Berkeley in 1970, 71, 72, something like that. Mm-hmm. So, so um, and, and John's just a fabulous colleague. And so we taught this course together. And for me, it was a way of learning about energy systems because I wanted, I wasn't happy just studying climate change. I actually wanted to understand what to do about it. Yeah. Um, and so for the last decade or so, I've taught a course for undergraduates where I actually make them design a low carbon economy. The first sort of 60% of the course is about climate uh-huh. and paleoclimate. So they learn all of the things we've <laughs> talked about. Yeah, sure. And then we take a switch and we say, okay, so now we're going to solve the problem. And they have to design an economy. It's for the US, but we talk about the world as well. Um, and we're going to design a low carbon economy quantitatively. And they actually see how incredibly difficult it is. Yeah. It's really not easy. Yeah. Yeah, well, if it, yeah, exactly. Well, one might think if it was easy, it would be done, but I'm not even sure of that. It's really hard. Yeah, because people just don't understand the risks, but yeah. I think that's, to me, the fun part of this is not just studying the Earth system and not just studying the modern climate and the future climate, but actually thinking about the energy systems that inter- interact with it. It's interesting to call it fun. From a f- scientific perspective, it's fun for the fact that society has to do this and there'll be incredible societal implications. It may not be so fun, but we'll... we'll We'll see. Yeah, I've got to say, so, so, um, I mean, you said this earlier, that's what makes climate change so difficult uh-huh. is because um, we always want to push it off. Yeah. You know, some people say climate change is the most important problem of our time. Mm-hmm. And I actually think that's exactly wrong. The reason, climate change is the most difficult problem of our time, uh-huh. but it's the most difficult problem because it's never the most important problem. Yeah. That's what's it's so nefarious so ur- about it. never it. seems urgent. Yeah. It's never It's like urgent. the frog in the boiling water. And, yeah. it, it, and I think it's the combination of two cruel aspects of the climate problem. Mm-hmm. First, and, and, and this is me sort of thinking like a political theorist a little yeah. bit, but, but um, the first is that it's a global collective action problem. Mm-hmm. And we're really bad at collective never, action yeah, problems. Glo- global, yeah, global collective action problems. It's unprecedented in the history of humanity, in a sense. The, the free rider issue, mm-hmm. that is, you know, w- why should I pay money yeah. if I can sneak without doing it and let everybody else pay the yeah, money? Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's really hard. Yeah. Right? So, so you know, and, and, why should and moreover, I, why should I pay money when other people aren't? I mean, that's the other th- other thing. Why should we be the first to have a carbon tax or something when other countries aren't? Why should we suffer? That's right. Yeah. And it's real. And the problem is, it's real money. Yeah, it's real cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's going to be hard work to fix this. So so doing this globally is we've never done anything like this. Yeah, by itself, that may make this the hardest problem in the world. But there's another aspect that makes it even worse and maybe much worse. And that is just about every aspect of the problem has really long time scales. We talked about the oceans, right? That they have centuries, maybe millennia of warming still embedded in them. The time scale of the carbon cycle, we talked about tens of thousands of years. What about the ice sheets? You know, we are, my guess is we've already probably committed ourselves to melting of Greenland. Yeah, Greenland is equivalent to about seven meters of sea level rise. Yeah, well, okay, good, okay. We're beginning to get these numbers that I was- as a physicist, you know, there's what I love about telling audiences about Greenland. Greenland is so massive, it has its own tide. Oh, wow. Did you know this? No, I didn't know that about Greenland. So if you actually, so Greenland has about seven meters of sea level equivalent, meaning uh-huh. if you melted all the ice in Greenland, the Greenland ice sheet's about three kilometers tall. If you melted all the ice on Greenland, mm-hmm. sea level on average would rise seven meters. 23 feet or something yeah, yeah. like that. And, and I want to, I want to step back for a second. I, I will get, because when people talk again, it's one of these things when IPCC talks about, oh, there's a centimeter a sea level rise or whatever. People think, oh, well, who the heck cares about that? And it, it, and I remember when I first was exposed to the data, the thing that amazed me is historically looking back, and this was from ice cores in Antarctica and in the Dead Sea, I guess, it, carbon dioxide temperatures have fluctuated, but sea levels have fluctuated plus or minus 80 meters in the last 500,000 years or something like that, I think. Well, so so the glacial interglacial cycle. So yeah. remember that, you know, 20,000 years ago, we were in a glacial maximum. Uh-huh. Today we're in an interglacial mm-hmm. or the pre-industrial, yeah. we were in an interglacial. We're kind of a post-interglacial today. Yeah. Um, uh, 
During the last glacial maximum, 20,000 years ago, sea level was about 130 meters lower than today. Yeah. So. And the reason was there was a big ice sheet over North America yeah. called the Laurentide. Boston, here we are, we were under more than a kilometer of ice, right? Very different yeah. world. Yeah, it's a very, and, and, and that's, people need to realize that there have been changes in, in, in not, you know, in almost historical time, you know, in a sense that, that, that have been huge. And, and it, but they were still slow. So remember yeah. the deglaciation where, where the sea levels rose from, from 130 meters lower yeah. up to today, that took 10,000 years. Exactly. And, and and so it's all about time scale. So Greenland melting. So I would, let me just tell you yeah. about the tides of Greenland because it's a yeah, cool little fact. Let's get the tides of Greenland and then let's talk about what happens when Greenland melts. So Greenland, seven meters of sea level equivalent, okay. right? Yeah. So, so if you melt Greenland, sea level goes up seven meters. Yeah. Let's imagine we melted a seventh of Greenland. Okay. Okay? Uh -huh. So sea level would go up one meter on okay. average. Okay. Mm -hmm. But if you were standing at the southern tip of Greenland, mm -hmm. you would see a sea level fall by 19 meters. And the reason is that the Greenland ice sheet is so massive, <laughs> it actually gravitationally pulls the ocean towards it, just like the moon pulls the, I see. the ocean. So, so if it becomes less massive, it's le it pulls it, it releases less. releases the ocean. Oh, to the rest of the world, I guess. Now, on average, the rest of the <laughs> wow, ocean is a, at a that's, meter. But that's it, amazing. That's how big I it never, is. I never knew. That's, that is quite but, amazing. But you, know, you sort of step back and you say, wow, it's really big. Yeah. And um, we are unleashing these kind of forces. There's a similar story about Antarctica. By the way, Antarctica is about seven or eight times bigger than yeah, Greenland. Yeah. So the Antarctic ice sheet's massive. Yeah. So so we are, you know, with with the Ross ice shelf, for example, we could be committing ourselves to tens of meters of sea level rise. Again, that could be over many centuries. Well, although but you can it's, see a, it. it's something I've, I've... that future generations can't do anything they about. They can't exactly, <laughs> and we're committing them now, and and. And I mean, I've been down in Antarctica, and boy, you can see the changes. It's 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 extraordinary, and, extraordinary, and, and, and the changes just in the last two decades in Greenland, and and the and seven meters. Just so people realize, I mean, it may sound like, well, who cares? I'm more than seven meters above sea level right now, but but seven, actually, right here, uh -huh. um, we're a little bit less than seven uh, meters. Oh above yeah, here sea in level. Boston, that's right. Well, exactly. so, so actually, in Cambridge, uh, uh, right here, we're standing. We're above. Seven meters, but most of the houses where the undergraduates live yeah. mm -hmm. are below twenty-three feet. <laughs> yeah. um, Just the Florida, effect in all of Florida, all gone. of Florida. But and but forget Florida and us. Let's talk about Bangladesh. Let's talk about where billions of people live and are going to have to move. Well, but let's talk about New York and Shanghai. And, yeah, you know, everywhere, all the big cities in the world, they're all affected by that. Um, Although the rich, the, I, you know, we're jumping all around, but I think it's important to hit some of these topics while you while you mention. It. Yeah, New York will be will be a disaster, but New York also we has resources. But much so maybe you I mean, maybe you can imagine a big wall around New York. I mean, we could get Donald Trump started on that right now. But the third world, where where and again, so, correct me so if I'm wrong. Where the, so where let's the, not call it the third world. Let's call it the developing the world. the developing world, where especially in mid, mid the equator level, where where which is poor and has huge populations. In my understanding, will also be, get and uh, the the brunt of of the problems having to do with climate change. So you know, Lawrence, I actually think um, I, I I agree with that to some extent. Uh -huh. I actually think the climate community has made a mistake in framing it that way. Okay, interesting. And the reason is that many people walk away thinking that climate change is about the poor people in Bangladesh. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Which and you means know that you know, don't worry about it. It's really not about that. Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of things. This gets into the question of of what some people call adaptation, what I call preparedness. Yeah, I think preparedness is a better way to talk about it yeah. because, um, first of all, I think adaptation sounds painful. Uh -huh. Do you want to adapt? Yeah, yeah, no, no. Preparing Nobody wants to adapt. Yeah, Whereas yeah, preparing yeah, is yeah, very yeah, positive. Yeah, yeah. That's mm -hmm. what the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts do. Well, a lot of this. Look, let's face it. A lot of this is going to require words and selling. Because people are not naturally tuned to think about things on that time frame of children or grandchildren. People, you know, the risk assessment, of course, in humans is just remarkably, um, through evolution, inappropriate on, on these timescales. Our we, political institutions, our business institutions, everything we have does short timescale planning. And, and also small risks compared to large risk. I, I mean, it was just, uh, I had to change my plans to come here because of 737 MAX 8, which... As, tr as horrible as that was, 
There are tens of millions of people that fly in those planes every every day, or we're flying. And yeah, two the planes went down. The probably still less than you taking an Uber from the airport yeah, to here. Yeah, but we have quickly removed all those planes because there's a one in a million or one in a hundred million chance of getting getting killed in them. But we're on a slow time scale doing things with a hundred percent likelihood of of changing, but That's we right. don't think of that as a risk. So this gets into this question of preparedness and the time scale issue, and I think yeah. those are the, those two intertwine. I have a friend named Kelsey Worth who's designed, organized something called Mothers Out Front Uh with the idea that mothers are particularly suited to thinking about long timescales and future generations, which I think is a very clever idea. I think we need lots of experiments like that. But in terms of the the, question about Bangladesh or Indonesia or tropical countries, um, the developing world, it is true. The developing world is going to get hit hard. But it turns out the developed world's going to get hit hard too. Yeah, okay. And and um, I mean, look at Houston or look mm-hmm. at the coast of Florida, the Gulf Coast after Hurricane Michael. Mm-hmm. It's like a bomb went off. Yeah. So we are vulnerable too. Mm-hmm. Um, now that's not to say that many people in the developing world, because they are so poor and they maybe have no place to go because of political boundaries, uh, various conflicts. In fact, you know, you may see. New conflicts arise well, because of migration. Yeah. But but here's the important point that I think the question of vulnerability is interesting. In some ways, people who are very poor um, are quite resilient because yeah. they have nothing to lose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And 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 that's not to say that in any way that I'm not sympathetic to yeah. the poor people in Bangladesh. Yeah. But on the time scale of sea level rise in Bangladesh, those people will move. Well, but yeah, but but here's as complicated as climate systems are, and from your experience in politics, so human social systems are 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 at least equally complicated. And when you have several hundred million people who need to move, there is zero doubt, at least seems to me, that the socio political consequences of migrations, the the un- instability, the government instabilities, will trickle throughout the world. Yeah. And so that the so the first world is the developed world is going to be impacted not just directly by hurricanes or sea level rise but by the fact that there is much bigger instability or at least drivers of instability in the rest of the world. That's absolutely true and certainly the Pentagon has thought about that and well, done in fact, some important you know, there work. Was, I was just looking today at, and this is not new but but it's still worth stre- stressing that the same government and we're the only major country in the world where one of the leading parties still still denies still denies climate change, uh, uh, that nevertheless, no matter what's being done, said by the Trump administration, that right now the military is 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 a, a, ex- preparing for it at, at an active level because they, they have to. And so the realities are there no matter what the politicians may say. So in 2012, you know, we had just had um, a heat wave that summer in the U.S. Mm-hmm. 50% of U.S. counties were in emergency drought conditions. And then that fall in October, we had Superstorm Sandy hit mm-hmm. New York and New Jersey shore. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if you remember, but in the 2012 election, when President Obama beat Mitt Romney, uh-huh. Mayor Bloomberg came out as a Republican uh-huh. and endorsed President Obama because of climate change about two weeks before the election uh-huh. or a week before the election. Now, I think probably President Obama would have won anyway at that point. Y- yeah. But it's important to understand that that was a significant point. And and I I was serving on his Council of Science and Technology Advisors, Uh and the president asked us for ideas. He said, I want to do something more on climate change in my second term, Uh and I want your help. And so I was lucky enough to to draft the, the memo to the president that we wrote on this topic. And the first thing we said was, focus on national preparedness, which at the time was considered radical. It was considered, we were trashed by many climate scientists, climate policy people. Because it, for many reasons, but it makes it, one of the reasons that people are concerned about is they think, oh, you're throwing up your hands. You're saying, let's not, let's not deal with climate change. That's what George W. Bush said. We'll just adapt. We don't need to do anything. We'll just adapt. Yeah, which is of course not, not just equally Um, worse. Now we pointed out that our, that was our first recommendation. Our second, third, fourth, and fifth all had to do with reducing emissions. Yeah. So it wasn't like we were giving yeah, up yeah. by any means. Yeah, yeah. But after these catastrophic weather events, we were spending almost a hundred billion dollars that year on climate related damages. Yeah. Instead of we said, you know what? 
this is actually important, but there was another point that we made in that report that I think people have lost sight of, which is, and, and this may get to a little bit of human psychology and the way people mm. respond to this kind of damage. It, collective action, global collective action is hard. Yeah. Why should I do something if China or yeah. Russia aren't gonna yeah. do anything? Mm. Long time scale's hard. Okay, I, I care about my children and grandchildren, but I've got problems now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not gonna put money, pay, pay money so that they can be okay. Um, now, that, that's all hard. What do people really care about? I actually think they care about protecting themselves, mm -hmm. protecting their families, protecting their communities. That's mm -hmm. very sure. um, primal. Mm -hmm. So what we argued to President Obama was that if you actually focus on people's vulnerabilities locally, and it's different in Florida mm -hmm. than it is in Boston, and different in Boston than it is in Colorado, and different in Colorado than it is in Iowa. So different climate impacts. Yeah. You know, if you talk about sea level in Colorado, not so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly, right? Yeah. On the other hand, in Florida, that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. So, so you have to think about what local vulnerability is and help communities prepare for climate change. That is fundamentally a positive thing, protecting I mean, your community, protecting yeah. your home, mm -hmm. right? That's just a good thing. And by the way, it also kind of gets rid of the concern about attribution of storms. You know, there's always, every time there's a big storm, yeah. people say, is it caused by climate change? Yeah. And you sort of, climate scientists stumble all over themselves saying, well, statistically it's related, but we can't say that yeah. any individual storm, blah, blah, blah. And already the viewers have turned off. The fact is, if you're prepared, it doesn't really matter whether climate change caused the storm or not. Yeah. You're prepared. It's a good thing. Yeah, preparation. Right? And inevitably, again, it's it makes such economic sense because preparation costs so much less than the than dealing but with after the fact. If you're getting people to prepare, and in doing so, they're actually learning about their vulnerabilities, Yeah, we believed that it was likely that people would say, you know what, maybe we should support some policies to actually fix this problem once and for all. Because the more I learn about this, this is not a good thing, yeah. right? If I'm in Miami Beach, I'm saying, okay, I can prepare, I can protect my home, I can build some seawalls, I can put some things on stilts, I can put mm -hmm. some sump pumps in. But this is just, this is not going anywhere good. Maybe we need to stop this. Well, yeah, though the, you know, the problem of course is that also, at least we're, when we're observing the current political climate, it makes it makes you susceptible to people who, simply have other reasons for not wanting to, people to deal with this from saying, well, look, these people are scaremongers. They want you to prepare for things that aren't going to happen or prepare, you know, they're, they're, attribu you know, they're attributing things to, to the wrong thing and they're trying to get you to spend money and because and, the government wants to spend money. And how so there does are one people like that. And, you know, we've, we've spent oh, some there's time- There's a whole party of the people like that. There are, you know, our co <laughs> some, we talked to some of the physicists who are mm. hostile to this. Yeah. In, when we were in Mexico together yeah, a year ago. Not, when you and I were, yes. Um, but but the reality is, I think most people get it. In fact, the polls say 70% of this country actually is concerned about climate but, change. I mean, but are you at all concerned about the fact that one of the people that we were, were with in Mexico, who was just totally hostile to any notions, is now the person who's, the, who's President Trump's advisor on this whole subject? Am I concerned about it? <laughs> not not any more than I'm concerned about anything else going on in Washington okay. today. Um, I think the important thing is that, look what just happened in Nebraska with the floods. Yeah. I think you talk to farmers in Nebraska, you talk to farmers in Iowa, Yeah, they actually get it. Yeah, and, well, you and, know, and, and, and I think that the tide, well, the tide is rising, but I think, I think the important point is that, um, I think we're ready for a big political transformation. And I think where, where this has to come is it has to become a post-partisan issue. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, I spent some time with uh, Representative Eric Cantor. Do you yeah. remember Eric Cantor? Yeah, I remember Eric Cantor. He was the House Majority Leader. Yeah. And he was very conservative. He, mm. at least in the press, they portrayed him as, as you know, anytime John Boehner wanted to make a compromise, Eric Cantor would, would pull, pull him back, back to the right. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to Eric Cantor in his office about climate change. He asked me to come in and I was a little surprised because I was on President Obama's yeah. science council. Yeah. And um, so like, why are you talking yeah. to me? Yeah. And he said, I, I, we talked about climate change. He chastised me a little for yeah. some comments I made about coal. And, but then he, he said he liked how I talked about the problem and about technology. Mm -hmm. And he wanted me to help his staff design a strategy for conservative Republicans that 
would be acting on climate change, not through denial. Mm -hmm. And I was a little surprised. I said, why are you doing this? And he said, number one, we've purged all knowledge from our party, so we don't actually have anybody to advise us on yeah. this. And number two, Republicans under 35 think we're crazy. Yeah, the, And the, he saw the writing on the wall that basically the Republican Party needs to switch. Yeah, no, this is a really important point. Uh, the, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, one can look around, and I think people are ready for change. But Now remember, were, he, got, he, got, he lost his primary he lo three weeks he lo later. He lost it, I know, exactly. <laughs> so I never got to do this work. And let me say, and I was a little concerned when you talk about this. Interestingly, when I was um, chair of the board of the Bolton Atomic Scientists, we, one of the things we did, we had an event in Congress where we talked about climate change and other existential risks. And I was, I was saddened at the time that it was open to all staffers. And, the, and, all, and I was hoping, and what surprised me was that only the Democratic staffers came to that. And I, I, th I was really surprised because I thought it would be a, a bipartisan issue of just learning about the science. And I was, uh, and, and, and by the way, I should, since we should make full disclaimers, you were not only on Obama's uh, science Council for the for while he was president, I was on one of, on his advisory panel when he was running into. So we all have we have our yeah uh, our connections. No, no, but, but but here's the interesting thing. Um, I think that the path forward in this country, the real ch sea change, will happen when both parties are competing for better solutions. Yeah, but I also think it'll happen within its generational. I think you hit the point that the Republicans under thirty five. I think. That what is clearly happened, and it's good, and in spite of the incredible amount of money being spent to obfuscate the issue, that generationally we're beginning to see, and, and you know, young people be concerned about many things. And anytime young people are concerned about many things, I think it's a great thing, and that's pro a property of having grown up in the '60s, I think. But, but once you have a generation that wants to change it, it doesn't really matter what the politicians are going to do, and. So are you in? Are, are you encouraged? There, there's a you know there was this young student strike here in this country, in in I think at Stockholm there's a young girl who was there's all these I mean I'm not sure. So I had dinner last week with the Sunrise Movement, uh -huh. um, which is the group who started the Green New Deal. Yeah, these are incredibly thoughtful, interesting young people, mm -hmm. 25 years old. You know the founder, a lovely woman named Varshini Prakash, yeah. fabulous. Um, now, at 25, is she an expert on energy technology yeah, and policy? Yeah. Of course not. But what she gets, which frankly, a lot of people in the climate policy community haven't gotten over the last two decades, mm -hmm. is the urgency. Yeah, they are. She says, we need to do this now. We're going to do this in 10 years. Now, there are all sorts of technical reasons why that's not possible. And I can explain why that you yeah. know, you just can't. And the reason is the energy system of the US and the energy system of the world, it's just too big, too much cement and steel, you can't possibly build all that infrastructure in 10 years. And they say, why not? And, yeah. and you know what? I think there's they are opening up an opportunity to do something way more substantial than anyone imagined. And I think that's really important to, that, to watch. I think that, yeah, that you, you made a key point that was that what, it, what we're doing now, what's already been done, forget what's doing now, is going to impact our children and our children's children, we have left them a legacy. And it is, it, it, they're the ones who are going to suffer. Now you can always say, well, if you care about your grandchildren, care about, but, but it seems to me that that therefore is the, the community of people who should be most receptive because uh, you're younger than me, but still we're not gonna, we're not gonna witness the, wor the most severe implications of what, what's already been done to, to climate. And so it seems to me that we really need to reach the young people, not just because they're the future, but because they're the ones who are really going to have to. Yeah, I think we that. need to reach everybody. Yeah, young but, people unfortunately don't vote, and that's yeah. a, a terrible thing in this country. But yeah. we, but, but they will. But the point is, if I guess you know, it's yeah. True. But it's funny. You know what happens, Lawrence? Yeah. Young people become old. It's really yeah. strange. Yeah, I know it happens. But if they if they're radicalized when they're young, I mean, I can't help but think that. The fact that I grew up in the '60s has impacted on my politics, and in my in, in now that I'm in my '60s, uh, anyway. So I so that's one thing I think. So I think, so, so here I think I think there's a couple things to say about technology that's yeah, really important. Yeah. First of all, in 2009, when Obama came into office, mm -hmm. we were in the midst of one of the most terrifying financial crises. Yeah. And most of the leading economists in the U.S. 
both conservative and progressive, they, they really believed that the whole financial system of the U.S. could topple. Yeah. And our con- I mean, it could be a total collapse. Yeah. They were terrified. Mm-hmm. So we, remember, a Republican Congress yeah. passed a trillion-dollar stimulus package. Yeah. Un- unbelievable. Uh-huh. Why? And, and Democrats bailed out the big banks. Yeah, yeah. Things you wouldn't expect on either side. Things you wouldn't expect because people were scared. Mm-hmm. Recently, a radio producer, a radio show a talk talk host said to me, "Well, did President Obama miss an opportunity there to do the Green New Deal because we had a trillion dollars?" Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, he actually spent close to a hundred billion on energy systems, yeah. uh-huh. um, which was extraordinary. But here's the difference: in 2009, the price of solar and wind were about five times what they are today. Mm-hmm. We have seen an extraordinary change in technology in terms yeah. of cost. Five years ago, six years ago, Massachusetts, Boston was considering uh, uh, Cape Wind, which yeah. was a, which was windmills out in in Nantucket Sound. Yeah, yeah. the Kennedys opposed it. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, they didn't like their view yeah. from Hyannisport being damaged. Um, but a lot of people opposed it for one simple reason: it was almost twenty one cents a kilowatt hour. Yeah. That's the wholesale cost, not the not the cost to consumers, yeah. right? You probably have to triple that. I mean, yeah. that was like three times the cost of of the power they were competing against. Yeah. Just this year, Massachusetts signed a contract with with Vineyard Wind to build a four hundred megawatt offshore wind farm uh, at six and a half cents a kilowatt hour, factor of three lower in just a few years. So, so the point is that we have technology today that we didn't have then. Electric vehicles. Which you know still are too expensive. Yeah, but you know what? We're beginning to see a change. You know, how, you know, not 2018. Two percent of electric, two uh, percent of new vehicle sales were electric vehicles. Yeah, which is that's extraordinary. It's extraordinary given what, it, what you know a decade ago. Yeah. So, so again, are we there yet? No. What do you? Let me just. I'm going to try and be the devil's advocate. What do you say? And I've heard this for some people saying, "Yeah, this is all good stuff," but. But it's going to get better. So why do it now? I mean, it, it uh, you know, solar and, and and wind will be cheaper ten years from now. So let's wait till ten years from now to do that. What do you say to them? The answer is perhaps. But right now, um, uh, offshore wind in Massachusetts at six and a half cents is actually you know substantially Inter- preferable. Perfect. Yeah. To almost everything else. You know, a few years ago, just a few years ago, I had a student do a study of renewable energy choices in Massachusetts, mm-hmm. and offshore wind. Or bringing wind from far away were far, far more expensive than building a cable up to Quebec and bringing hydro uh-huh. power down from Quebec. Yeah. But you know what? That's no longer true. It, offshore wind has gotten really cheap. It's almost directly competitive with natural gas. And in the winter, we actually don't have enough natural gas pipeline capacity. And so natural mm. gas power is really expensive. Yeah. And so, in fact, offshore wind could be a very good deal. Mm-hmm. It's really competitive. So so I think those things are 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 really close. Okay, what do you do about uh, there are there are powerful groups with lots of money that spend that money to direct public opinion. Much more than the research budget of the IPCC is spent it spent trying to obfuscate this issue. And so these are these are rational policies, but rational policies aren't always enacted. It, is there a way to get through the, this message through in a way that people? Uh, so now you're talking about communication. Yeah, I think there is a way. I'm doing an experiment with a colleague of mine. A friend of mine is is a um, chief marketing officer at a at a large marketing firm in New York. Mm-hmm. We've created something we're calling potential energy, <laughs> and what it is, it's actually never been tried. Mm-hmm. Um, what we've got is we've got about twenty of the world's best advertising agencies, uh-huh. all pledging to work pro bono, okay. doing serious marketing research, mm-hmm. like social science, yeah, sure. coupled with creative work. These are the, you know, these are the companies that do advertising for Nike and yeah. for Coca-Cola yeah. and for, you know, th- yeah. these are the most creative minds in the business. Uh-huh. And they want to work pro bono because they care about this issue. And we're trying to raise some money to actually produce spots. We're focusing regionally. So we're starting with Florida. Okay. Um, but this has really never been tried. Environmental groups have used advertising agencies yeah, yeah. to project their message, but that's not quite the same thing as saying, let's look at the research and actually figure out, just as they do with products. You know, when they take Coca Cola, 
they're not marketing just with creatives. Yeah, yeah. They're doing very careful well, research about who is the target audience and yeah. what is it what is it that they're going to respond to. Well, it's great they're doing this pro bono. It'll be interesting to so see. So we're going to see if we can try this. Again, to me, you have to take shots on goal. You've got yeah. to try. You just try and everything. And try a lot see, of things. See what works. We used to say, even in the nuclear issue, what will be the Sputnik moment? And and people keep saying that, you know, in the, in terms of dealing with not just nuclear weapons, but other existential threats like climate change, you know, Sputnik was somehow, it, it changed this country in terms of the, the decision to put resources into education and science. And, and, There's and, one other thing that's really important. Mm -hmm. Years ago in 2004, I had an event at Harvard with Vice President Al Gore mm -hmm. and Larry Summers. Mm -hmm. It was a very interesting combination. Larry Summers was president of Harvard and yeah. had just stepped down as treasury secretary in 2000 after in the Clinton administration. Yeah. And uh, Larry Summers got up on stage and said something I think that's very wise. He said, and this is in 2004, okay. just after the Kerry election, okay. losing to Bush. Yeah, yeah. Larry Summers said, you know, action on climate change is going to take a really long time, much longer than people think in Washington. Mm -hmm. But when it comes, it's going to come really fast. And the role of a university is to be prepared with a plan because the staffers in Washington mm -hmm. are not going to do the careful analysis and discussion and thought that a real plan for dealing with this requires. So we need the plan. And I think that's really sage counsel. Now that plan needs to be constantly updated to yeah. different technologies and different things. 10 years ago, you wouldn't have predicted that solar and wind would have gotten quite as cheap as they've gotten. So it's changed everything. Yeah, no, I, and, I, and I, 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 you know, I put my optimistic and my pessimistic hats on alternatively. I just, I hope that he, that you know I'm not op, I'm not always optimistic that good plans will be will even if you if they're available will be. So will I be actually used. don't like the optimism versus I don't like yeah. the optimism pessimism yeah. framing, yeah, and I'll yeah. tell you why, Lawrence. Okay. <laughs> um, I have a lot of colleagues in this field in energy policy, climate policy, yeah. who say I've heard them say, "Well, we ha we have to give people hope. Yeah, we can't let people despair. Yeah, yeah." And and I step back and I think about it and I say, you know what? I'm a scientist. Mm -hmm. My job is to observe the natural world with as few biases as I can. You yeah. know, I, I try to shed all the biases yeah. I have. Mm -hmm. It's not that I don't care about nature. I don't, you know, I care about all these things. But when I'm observing the world, I try to put those yeah. perspectives aside and see things as they are, as best I can. Yeah, sure. And that, Right? Mm -hmm. And then describe it. Yeah. And to me, sometimes in my class, people say, boy, you sound so pessimistic. I'm like, no, actually, I think about myself as an optimist. Yeah. I just don't think that pessimism or, or that optimism based in delusion is very helpful. No, no. I mean, what, what we and, do, and, what people deserve is reality. But, you know, when even we've done public events, I think what we is just what you said, the reality is dismal. But that doesn't, but what we don't want people to do is say there's no, that, that they can't do anything. So there's one aspect of this that I also think some of the environmental NGOs. Mm -hmm get wrong, uh -huh. which is human capacity to adapt. Yeah, absolutely. Humans, I what I have a lot of faith in, and maybe this is just faith, but I, but I think there's historical justification for yeah. it. Humans are ingenious. We are the most innovative, incredible species. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of predictions miss the fact that technology and human adaptation will, will do things you hadn't expected. I've been giving talks about this where I sort of say, look, you know, the time scale of energy systems, the time scale of climate change, is they're all long. Yeah. You know, they're many decades at least to many centuries to millennia. Mm -hmm. This is a killer problem. It's the collective action problem. It's the, it's the long time scale problem. Humans are really bad at that. But there's a great quote from H.G. Wells that I love. Uh -huh. He said, we are kept keen on the grindstone of pain and necessity. <laughs> yeah. And I think there's some truth to that. I, that's not to say that humans won't suffer. Yeah. Many humans will suffer terribly, maybe yeah. even die because of yeah. climate change. And we need to take that seriously. And that's a terribly moral yeah. obligation we have to the future. But I also believe that the 21st century, because of climate change, is likely to be the most innovative century in our history, but not necessarily in energy technology. Yeah. It's going to be in things like architecture.
Yeah. It'll be things like transportation, agriculture, uh, maybe even governance. Yeah, yeah. You know, the fact is, dealing with climate change, we haven't talked about solar geoengineering. Well, no, we're going to get there. I, as but, I went but, in with like, that. you know, things like that require new global governance yeah. that's way beyond what the UN can do. And and you know what? I actually think humans will f- muddle through and figure out. By the way, nature <laughs> is going to get screwed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The fact is. You know, the natural world, first by human land use, and now climate change is going to come finish the job. It doesn't mean there won't be natural things. There'll be plenty of wild space and yeah. trees growing and birds and animals, yeah. but, it, it, you know, it'll be nothing like what... It's, it's going to be Earth 2.0 or 3.0, yeah. That's right. And I mean, in terms of adaptation, I think you're right. I, I think with Sartre but, but, said that humans can learn to live in the trunk of a tree if they need to. But. Don't underestimate how adaptive humans are. Yeah, humans know. are incredibly resilient. And by the way, there's sometimes when you hear people talk about climate change and you you know say, oh, four degrees is the end of the world. Yeah. And you sort of say, no, it's not. Yeah. 50 million years ago, the Eocene, the earth was probably eight or 10 degrees warmer than today. And you know what? Had we been living there, yeah. we would have been just fine. Yeah, yeah. Now, the, the problem more... is getting from here to there in a, you know, in a thousand years or 500 years or 300 years, that's, that's really stressful and a lot of humans will suffer. But, there's nothing inherently unlivable about that. Well, planet. there's nothing inherently unlivable. Let me, let me, let me. I'm not so worried that physically it's impossible for humans to live under those conditions. What I'm more worried about is that the transition will cause instabilities that will cause human to use the weapons of mass destruction to end human life on so Earth. So I totally I, agree. I, I think the, that's the, more. The big risk is that um, our social systems and you know when humans are stressed, often. It's not very pretty. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think that's a more a more realistic concern than ending life. I often hear saying this could end life on Earth. Well, it won't directly, but it could cause humans to take the action to do that. Le- before I want to talk about, uh, you know, we've skirted it, but I want to make it clear to people who who haven't heard of this issue exactly what the change is in greenhouse gases. We really haven't said what the impact of human industrial activity is on that global historical time scale, just so people could put in perspective. We skipped it. And I think I think it's worth you spending a few minutes just giving sure, that. Sure, sure, sure. So, so 20,000 years ago, mm. last glacial maximum, we have a kilometer of ice where we're standing in Boston and Cambridge. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, carbon dioxide levels were about 180 parts per million. Okay. The pre-industrial, the interglacial, uh-huh. about 280 parts per million. And we've seen that cycle periodically over the last few couple million years. When Dave Keeling started measuring CO2 in 1958, yeah. it was already at about 315 parts per million. Uh-huh. So up about 35 parts per million from the pre-industrial level. Uh-huh. Today, we're about 412 parts per million. So we are really going into completely unexplored territory. That, ha- that, that has not been seen on Earth in at least the last few million years. At least probably four or five million years. And by mid-century, we're going to be well above 500 parts per million. And now we're talking about maybe 30 or 35 million years. Mm-hmm. So, so we're doing something extraordinary. And, and it's really important to realize that, that when people talk about, they see parts per million, who the heck cares about parts per million? That the natural cycle has not, has not anywhere approached this level. That's right. and, and, and moreover, as the natural cycle has varied over that, climate has varied tremendously. It's not as if, it's not as if, uh, sure, people can say, well, it didn't ever vary much, but who cares? But oh, it varied a small amount and climate changed dramatically. We're doing something that has never been, an experiment that's never been performed, and at least in the, in, in the last few million years. That's exactly history. right. And, and we can look at the paleo climate record mm-hmm. to get a pretty good sense of how sensitive the Earth's climate system is to changes in CO2. Yeah. Because we have CO2 reconstructions yeah, yeah, yeah. and we know how much the temperature yeah. changed. Yeah. And the answer seems to be that the sensitivity, that is, per doubling of CO2, you get a surface temperature change of about three or four degrees. Mm-hmm. Now, what we've experienced over the last hundred years is only about, you know, maybe one and a half to two degrees per doubling Mm -hmm. because we've only warmed by a little more than a degree and we haven't yet doubled CO2, right? Yeah, but we've got the oceans. But that's it. (laughs) So you have the oceans. So the other half is still coming. Yeah, yeah, the other half. So that's probably the resolution of that. So it's probably about three degrees per doubling. And just understand, three degrees doesn't sound like that much. But remember the difference between the last glacial maximum, sea level 130 meters lower, Mm -hmm. 
you know, North America, half of North mm. America covered with ice, the ice coming down mm. to New York City, a completely different world, right? Uh -huh. That was five degrees lower, colder, yeah. Yeah. right? So, so we're okay. talking about probably in the next 100 to 150 years being five degrees warmer. Yeah. It, it's extraordinary. Putting that, you know, in, in context, I think is really important because to me, when I talk to people, I say, well, we don't, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, but here's what has happened. Here's what may be possible. Here's the context. Do you want to gamble? Do you feel, do you feel lucky? Now, speaking of gambling, we've talked about adapt adaptation or preparedness and, and the reality of the, the social difficulties. And some people would, might say, well, look, I mean, and you would still say, look, there's this carbon dioxide that's going to impact on our children, our children's children, our children's children, and on. Can't we do something to help them? And a lot of people are talking about geoengineering as a way to not just be prepared or live with this new future for the next thousand years, but change it and take it back, either somehow removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere or doing things like blocking the sun or all, so all understand that those two things are really really different and yeah. we have to I, I we've we've collectively unfortunately called both of those things geoengineering yeah, and i think very, that's a terrible mistake i agree with you completely because one involves we know what will happen if you remove carbon dioxide we don't know what's going to happen if you put so removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere first of all people should understand that most ways of doing it are incredibly expensive. Yeah, it's... Uh, there are a lot of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs who think that they're going to invest in some magical technology. And what they don't understand is even if it gets as cheap as some of the advocates say... With $100 a ton will, is still incredibly uh, expensive. As long as some other countries are still burning fossil fuels, yeah. why would I pay uh -huh. to remove it? Yeah. Okay. You know, think about it. You know, you're on, the, you're on a lake uh -huh. and your neighbor across the way is on the same lake. You both yeah. have houses on the yeah. lake and there's some pollutant in the lake and you're paying to take this pollutant they're out and they're, and they're putting it in. Yeah. Like that's, yeah. that, that's not going to happen. Okay. Right. And, we're, and by the way, we're not talking about side payments of a little bit of money. Yeah. We're talking about, you know, trillions of dollars yeah, per year. Literally. Like yeah. we're not, this is not, this is not a small amount of money. Yeah. So, so, but there's another point, even if you did that, even if you could convince our country, for example, to spend, Pentagon scale dollars on removing CO2 from the atmosphere uh -huh. every year, you'd need to do it for the next hundred years. Mm -hmm. It's it's inherently slow yeah. because it's it's on the same time scale that we burn the fossil fuels and put it in. Mm -hmm. So so I mean, people forget that we are um, the world is putting in 40 billion tons of CO2 a year. That's what I was saying, 40 billion, 50 right? billion. Yeah. It's just, so so the idea that even if you took out a few billion a year, you'd have to be doing it for unless of course. I mean, yeah, you're right. Undoing uh, it would take a really long time. To make it practical would require some kind of sea change in technology. Now, it's not clear if the laws of chemistry and physics allow such a sea now, change. And the fact that Bill Gates and a variety of other entrepreneurs are putting money into these companies, a colleague mm -hmm. of mine, David Keith, has a company like yeah, this that yeah building a factory to scrub CO2 from the atmosphere. And we, we built a, th you know, a group at, where, at my old university. I know. Yeah. You know what? I, I don't think it's going to amount to anything, but I love that it's happening. Yeah. I have no problem with yeah, people's- me put, too. But, but, but the argument, you know, but if somebody asks me as an investor, should, should I invest in this because are they going to make money in the next mm. 20 years? I'm like, wait a second. At least not the kind of money they're thinking. Okay, so so but, that's but the that's, other kind of geoengineering is a totally different thing. Exactly. Let's get to that other kind because there's discussions of it, but but there are concerns that one at least that I have. So maybe you can. So solar geoengineering, it's an old idea, right? It was in a presidential report to President Johnson. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the in the in the sixties. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is an old idea. This was a favorite idea of Edward Teller, okay, so, which is a good reason yeah. to sort of be skeptical of yeah, it. Well, or be concerned. Yeah, 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 that's right. And and there's certainly people irresponsible in this who say, oh, we should just do it because it's cheap. Mm -hmm. Not realizing that what we're talking about, and, and when I say solar geoengineering, I'm not talking about, so let's say there's, there's different ideas. Some people say we can make low-level clouds that will reflect sunlight yeah. and cool the earth. Other people say we can put aerosols in the stratosphere and reflect yeah. sunlight. Other people say we could put mirrors in space. Yeah. Those now I'll tell you, um, I think the only thing worth talking about is the stratospheric aerosols. Yes. Not everybody agrees with me, but let me explain why. Mm -hmm. The space-based mirrors, yes. lovely solution, unbelievably expensive. Yeah. It just seems- Not going to happen. Ridiculous. It seems very Star Wars-like. Very yeah. expensive. Yeah. The low-level clouds have the opposite problem. They may be cheap, but the problem is the time scale of mm -hmm. control is really short. Mm -hmm. They last hours to maybe a day, yeah. which means 
if you're going to use it to control the climate, yeah. you need to be doing it all, all the, the time. time. In ways no are... interruptions. Um, the time scale of stratospheric aerosols, uh -huh. depending on how high you put them, is yeah. one to two years. Yeah, yeah. That's a time scale that you still need to keep doing it. But, you know, if you have a couple weeks of crisis, you can... Oh, yeah, no, the aerosols, I was talking about the low-level clouds. I, I'm not... I, I think clouds the, and their the, impact the, on the climate The aerosols still... with a couple, sort of one to two-year time scale, to me, that's the right time scale yeah. of control that's, that's appropriate. I'll buy that. Now... Um, you're absolutely right. We don't understand enough about exactly what it does. Remember, reflecting sunlight is not the same as reducing greenhouse gases. Yeah. The physics work differently. For yeah. example, night and day, yeah. right? The greenhouse gases work 24-7. Yeah. Because the Earth's radiating heat all the time yeah. and the greenhouse gases are working all the time. Yeah. Reflecting aerosols only work when there's sunlight. So it changes the day-night difference. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of subtle ways that this is going to change the earth. It's not going to perfectly compensate for greenhouse gases. It's imperfect. Yeah. But it is instantaneous. If you did it tomorrow, well, the climate would cool tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Okay? So that's kind of cool. Yeah. The best studies we've done show that actually it works a whole lot better than most of us thought. That the best models we've done, and we've done many, many different generations, and people have tried to show all the problems, mm -hmm. Um. Is it perfect? No. In, in particular, there are changes in precipitation that may be problematic. But you know what? If you compare it to not doing it, and when I get public talks about it, I use Winston Churchill's quote about democracy. Yeah, yeah You know, that the democracy best. is the worst form of government in the world, all except for all the others. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think solar geoengineering is the same. I think solar geoengineering is a, a um, arrogant, uh, crazy, techno-fix, awful way of dealing with the climate problem. But it may be the better. Except for the alternative, yeah. which is letting the climate system happen. People say, oh, we should just take CO2. We should just remove the CO2. And you yeah. say, I wish it were that easy. Yeah, if it were that easy. I mean, that's the obvious, if it, we could do that, that's the obvious solution. What is dangerous and what a lot of people get uncomfortable about solar geoengineering is the, what they call the moral hazard. The idea that by doing it, you reduce the pressure on reducing emissions. Yeah. So people keep going. And that is a real concern um, but you know what, to me, you know, we're talking about human misery. We're talking yeah. about the end of nature. So, um, got to start, you got to think of, you know, drastic and here's the problems other point. Are... this is a mistake that I think a lot of physicists made in the Manhattan project. Mm -hmm. They thought they were going to make the decision on whether yeah. to use the technology yeah. Okay. It's not our decision. And, so, and so I feel like we actually, so what we're doing at Harvard is we've created one of the first big research programs on this subject. Oh, good. And the reason is, I feel like we have a few decades to figure out all the possible things that might go wrong. Mm -hmm. Already, for example, I think we've made a big difference. I think the research community, not just at Harvard, but around mm -hmm. the world, if 10 years ago, if you were to talk about solar geoengineering, the way you, and, and if say somebody wanted to do it, say some yeah. country that China or the US wanted yeah. to do it, they would inject sulfur dioxide or sulfur yeah. particles into yeah. the stratosphere. It would get make sulfate aerosols, yeah. get oxidized yeah. and reflect sunlight. Uh -huh. But what we learn now is that that would come with a very big risk of, of hurting the stratospheric ozone layer, mm -hmm. which protects us from UV radiation. Yeah. So... What we're talking about now is putting other types of particles, maybe calcium carbonate, maybe mm -hmm. other things that actually wouldn't, they might wouldn't actually it? help the stratospheric yeah. ozone layer. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's the result of research. Which The point is, it's not our decision, but it is our, we have the potential power to help nudge the decision makers to, in a, in about a, in a, how they do it yeah. and if they do it. And mm -hmm. I think we need to study, to me, I've been very insistent that all the money we put into how to do it, mm -hmm. an equal amount of money should go into what are all the possible ways it could go wrong. Uh, well, absolutely. Because, and, because we need to essentially do a serious risk analysis of this. And, and you know, the problem of course, all the, actually, let me say the problem with all these things is that often what goes wrong is what you, you don't foresee. But but the good but, thing, but but let's get a whole lot of good, smart uh, people exactly. trying to so, think about all the problems. So yeah, and the, for me, the one solace is, as you said, is that it's, it's got a half life of a, of a year or two. So you screw things up. At least you're not screwing it up for ten thousand years. But understand that it's addictive. So so yeah, so when a, I say uh, I, I personally think that we're likely going to need to do this yeah. because I think the alternative is worse. Yeah. But remember, the best analogy I've heard is to is that it's really like morphine. 
which is, yeah. So, so solar geoengineering, putting aerosols in the stratosphere, it legitimately removes some of the pain of climate change. Yeah, but not It the... is possible that we could, for example, freeze Greenland and keep it from melting yeah. more. Mm -hmm. Hard to put the ice back, but yeah. at least we could keep it from progressing. Yeah. But understand that, that it doesn't fix the core problem. Yeah. And so it's a little bit like, you know, you have an appendicitis. You can, have, yeah. you can take morphine. And by the way, you want that morphine when they operate on you because mm. having surgery, serious surgery without any anesthesia, you'd be in misery. Mm -hmm. But if you only take the morphine and never actually get the appendicitis taken care of, it's a bad idea. Yeah, there's a line from the Rocky Horror Picture Show related to that too, about sort of <laughs> affecting the symptoms and not right. the cause. But, 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 that's, but that's cool. And here's the other analogy that's important. It's addictive. Yeah. Because once you start doing it and you keep emitting CO2, CO2 gets higher and higher. Yeah. You keep doing yeah. more of it. But now if you just stop, stop, it would be a lot worse. Yeah. The climate would suddenly so, warm abruptly and that would be a disastrous. Look, this has been a fascinating discussion of what is not an easy problem. But unless we talk about all these options, unless we inform ourselves of what the issues are in a realistic way, then we're not going to go anywhere. So I, I'm just so happy we had this chance to to do some justice to the many aspects. And we could do this another time for another two hours. And I'm we, sure we could dig it, in more. It, so, but thanks a lot for coming, Dan. It's, it's, been, fun. it's been great. great. Thanks. Thanks, Lawrence. The Origins Podcast is produced by Lawrence Krauss, Nancy Dahl, Amelia Huggins, John and Don Edwards, and Rob Zepps. Directed and edited by Gus and Luke Holwerda. Audio by Thomas Amison. Web design by Redmond Media Lab. Animation by Tomahawk Visual Effects. And music by Rickolis. To see the full video of this podcast, as well as other bonus content, visit us at patreon.com slash origins podcast.